Hey everybody, Ed Holmwood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope everyone's doing well today. Well, I had this idea about doing a series of videos about my five favorite audio products, whatever they happen to be, from the 80s. So we're gonna do it in categories. And it's probably gonna be, it's definitely gonna be integrated amps, receivers, speakers, DACs. Yeah, we did have DACs in the 80s, standalone DACs in the 80s turntables and maybe some accessories and some other items. So anyway, this is a generic introductory clip so that I don't have to redo it over and over again. So sit back, relax, and let's take a trip down memory lane together. Oh, the old guy's had five was spread in the night Bridging past and pressing in the glow of autumn light he holds the future gently like he held the past so tight in the old guy's hi-fi. Everything feels right. So the five products in each of these categories are just products that I either owned or I knew intimately and I had a lot of time to play with and listen to. And obviously they made an impression on me. There's not a best of, not a worst of. It's not a ranking. They're in no particular order. It's just, again, things that I, as I look back on them, say, oh yeah, I remember that piece. That was really, really good. Um, and that's really all it is. So we're going to get started right now. So the first product we're going to talk about is the Marantz SR8100 DC. Now this was a big stereo receiver in 1982. It was about 1600 bucks new. And you can see it's very different looking than the other Marantz products. And there is a reason for that. Now it's rated at 70 watts of channel and eight ohms, and it's got a frequency response of 16 Hertz to 30,000. At this period of time, in 1980, Marantz and Superscope had ended their relationship. Actually, Superscope had sold the Marantz assets outside of the United States to Philips, the Dutch company Philips. And then that officially marked the split between Marantz Worldwide and Marantz US, or what was Marantz US. So because of that, obviously Marantz Japan, who was really building the product, Standard Radio, was really building the product, now had more influence over the design then obviously Superscope, which wanted to, kind, wanted to kind of keep the same look going for, you know, probably forever, the blue dial and the gyro wheel, you know, tuning and all the other stuff. So that's why there's an, you know, um, equalizer integrated into this. Um, and also a kind of a different design philosophy on the internal side of it too. So anyway, after the split, Philips obviously integrated Marantz into its operations worldwide and began releasing all kinds of new Marantz products, this being one of them. Now, here in the US, Superscope was still distributing Marantz, although they didn't have any ownership and they didn't really have any influence over the brand itself as far as products and things like that. But they did retain the distributorship, it was pretty smart. So obviously Philips wanted to, at this point, you know, 82, 83, they, CD players are gonna be a big thing pretty fast. And being able to market under the Marantz name and the Philips name simultaneously was gonna give them some big market share. So. That's kind of what happened. So this product came from that era. Now, the other interesting thing is Superscope sold the U.S. distribution rights to Marantz to a company called Dynascan, who is known for Cobra radar detectors. Yeah, the Cobra radar de detector folks were the U.S. distributor for Marantz. And actually, at one point, they had gone to outside manufacturer to have Marantz products built for them exclusively, and it was called the Century Series, and it was home theater receivers. And honestly, they were really, really good. Um, but that whole relationship ended in 19, this was probably in the mid 80s when Superscope sold everything off to Dynascan or the distribution rights off to Dynascan. And in 1992, Dynascan sold everything to Philips. So Philips owned it worldwide and obviously Marantz be kind, of, kind of became its own entity. But during the Dynascan period in the 80s, the J Japanese product was being imported and that's what this 8100 DC was, was primarily a Japanese designed not super scope designed product. Um, and these were actually, you didn't see a lot of them. We had, we took some in trade in the store. And of course we're a Marantz dealer, um, probably starting 86 or so. And so we used to see some old Marantz gear come in and we had one of these come in and I, I took it home for probably, don't tell anybody, I think I had it for like six months. And it really was good. It had, very much the characteristic Marantz sound. It was warm, it was lush, it was had good power, even though it was rated at 70 watts a channel. 
Um, and, and of course, in those days, the way we listened to stuff was a lot different now. It was imaging was part of it, but it wasn't the biggest part. You know, full frequency response, full, you know, hearing everything, all of the frequencies low end to high end kind of was more important than necessarily soundstage and imaging. All that, that was starting to become more and more of a thing. Um, and this did a really good job at it. I ran it with a pair of uh, TDL transmission line tower speakers. I ran it with a pair of uh, KEF 104 twos, which we're going to talk about in the speakers for the 1980s. <clears throat> and I ran it through, I actually at one point it had a, a pair of Wilson Watts on it. Um, and it performed very well. It's a really great unit, really robust and a lot of fun. Um, we wound up making some money selling it. It was really a pretty unit. The thing that was my kind of drawback to it, although it didn't, it kind of came in handy a couple of times, and I'll admit it was the EQ. I wasn't at that time, I was kind of the purest guy and I didn't want to have EQs, but the thing sounded so good. And then having a little ability to, especially on the Wilson Watts, to give a little bass boost, you know, right around that 100 hertz range was really, really important. So anyway, the Marantz SR 8100 DC, one of my legendary receivers from the 1980s. So the next one I want to talk about is this unit here, the Sony taf 800 es Stereo integrated amplifier from 1988. It was about 1100 bucks new. Rated at 120 into 8, 180 into 4 ohms. This was a high current, big monster. It had a huge damping factor of like 100. Um, it had really good wide bandwidth, 2 hertz, so 100,000 hertz. This was an interesting period in the late 80s. Obviously, CD had been introduced, and Sony was up to their necks in digital because they were co-developer of the CD. And then they went even further, and they developed, obviously, on the video side, digital Betamax. They were obviously developing digital audio tape, DAT tape. Um, Philips was then involved with mini disc and all this other stuff. So they were looking at ways to expand their digital marketplace, but they were also looking at ways to expand their market reach. So regular Sony, yes. I mean, you could go down to your you know, maybe a local hi-fi store or, you know, certainly some of the big box stores in the days, Highland Fretter, Silo back in the day, Circuit City way back in the day. You could go in and buy regular lines. Sony product it was very popular. But ES was targeted toward that upper mid-fi entry level kind of high-end marketplace, the audiophile guys. And that was what the elevated standard was all about. So this amplifier was actually a dual mono design, big power supplies inside. It was really high current. Um, it could drive a lot of difficult speakers, and I, I drove um, the, the probably the most difficult speaker I ever drove on it. The Dahlquist DQ10s were kind of hard to drive. Um, we drove some early Magnapans on it. Um, we did drive a pair of Quad ESL63s with it, um, and it did okay. It would run a little bit out of juice. You know, you, some of those speakers you wanted to have a separate mono amp or a big bur burly stereo amp only thing, but for the, the kind of the person that wanted to get into that audiophile market, this was a great entry point, not cheap at 1100 um, bucks. And I don't know what that would be in today do, today's dollars. If I find out, I'll put it down here. But the build quality, it just, it was, all right. So you know what I liken it to? At this point in, in this period of time too, Toyota came out with Lexus and the Lexus LS400 blew everybody away. It blew Mercedes away and BMW and all the big luxury car manufacturers. They outdid everybody. You can, you know, you remember the old uh, commercial where they had the champagne glasses on the on the hood of the car while it was running at 100 miles an hour and it wasn't shaking or anything like that. That's what Sony was trying to do with the ES line, and it was built to a standard like that. It was just amazing, you know, huge, really, you know, beautiful die cast, especially on the CD players, die cast drawer mechanisms and transport mechanisms on the receivers that are on the stereo integrated amplifiers, you know, dual mono, dual power supplies, big output devices, lots of discrete componentry. It's so just really, really good. Now, I like this unit um, and I was not a big fan of Sony, but this sounded really, really good. We used to run it with the, the big high-end JBL speakers, and I don't remember the model numbers right now, but they were black piano finish. If I can find a picture of one, I'll insert it, and I'll put the model name down here. Um, and it worked really, really well with those. It had a really, it was very dynamic, had a really good detailed sound signature. And again, that was something Sony was very well known for in the day, especially with ES. You know, there was a lot of emphasis on, you know, with digital in those days. And digital was, in those days, early days, a lot of it was pretty strident and pretty fatiguing and pretty hot sounded. But, and that's kind of, you know, everybody got on the bandwagon of, oh, it's more detail. Well, I'm not sure it was more detail. It was a lot more energy. But this, this particular integrated 
played well with a lot of different components. And even with the Sony CD players, it sounded pretty good. So it had really good clarity across the frequency range. It had a good, strong bass response. It was a good, reasonably smooth mid-range. Um, again, a lot of detail. And of course, it's high current capability made it, you know, for rock and roll and for really dynamic stuff. Obviously, it handled all of that with ease. We took, we weren't Sony dealers. We took this in trade. Um, and what wound up happening is the guy wanted to trade it in. And I remember the story because he wanted to trade it in on a Hafler preamp and amp. And I think it was the XL280 amp. And after about, I don't know, probably 90 days or 100 days later, he wanted his Sony back. Um, and he wanted to, us to give him a refund on the Hafler stuff. And that was just way past our, our return policy. Um, and I had taken the Sony home with me to play with it and just to get a feel for it. Um, and so what we wound up doing is we wound up, giving, wound up charging him a restocking fee of 25%, took the stuff back, gave him back his Sony ES unit. And I, he was happy after that and I didn't see him, but it was a really nice piece. And again, this was a really interesting time, not only for Sony, but for a lot of people, you know, this burgeoning, you know, digital had kind of had a few years to try to, you know, get its sea legs. And so it was becoming, you know, CD was the way to go. A, a lot of the units I'm going to talk about, except the early 80s stuff, some of them didn't even have phono inputs on it. So that was kind of a thing because everybody thought digital was going to just take over the world. And it, at that point in time, it really was. So great unit, magnificent build quality, um, really stellar build quality, equal to any other product in its category, even at a higher price, just magnificently well built and a really good sounding unit as well. So the Sony TAF800S, 800, excuse me, ES extended standard integrated receiver, integrated amplifier. I need more coffee. So the next unit I want to talk about is the Rotel RX803. Now this was, the last year it was available was 1981. And I think they sold for about $550 and it was rated at 70 watts a channel, had a frequency response of five Hertz to 60,000 Hertz. So it was actually a really good performer. Now, in the early 80s, Rotel was just getting their toe in the, in the door here on the US market. It was only available sporadically. They didn't have a great distribution network, but they were starting to establish their relationship for having a really clean and detailed sound, which of course is something that they still have today. Um, but the thing that really launched Rotel in the US is they tied, they got tied up with a distribution that handled B&W here in the US. And of course, B&W, Bowers and Wilkins had been in the US for a number of years. And so Rotel became partners kind of through their distribution network. And that really started to make Rotel more accessible. Obviously, most B&W dealers at the time would pick up Rotel. And that relationship between Rotel and B&W kept going for a very, very long time. And I think Rotel's, that's changed now. I think Rotel's tied up with the company that owns Macintosh, but anyway, so, you always bought BMW dealers always had Rotel and it became uh, obviously a more premium brand. Now there were times when they offered some lower end stuff because the market was kind of demanding it, but they still had their high end product or their more, you know, more JDM market product. Um, but they were establishing their, their, their chops here in the U S and obviously that was really important to have that tie up with BMW. Now, of course, too, in the eighties and the early eighties, CD players are starting to become a thing and everybody and their brother wanted to hop on the bandwagon for CDs because it was exploding. So they did um, change some of their, their manufacturing and their philosophy to include the digital side, the CD side, um, and obviously other components, cassette decks, things like that, which they kind of always, had always been a man, uh, amplifier, integrated amplifier kind of manufactured back in Japan in the 50s and 60s. But Rotel began emphasizing what would become obviously its core design philosophy, which it still is today, and that is the balanced design concept, which focuses on the quality of the components that go in, the best circuit designs they know how to make, and maintaining really high signal noise ratio. And that's something I kind of hammer on a lot. The better your signal to noise ratio, the more fine detail can get through and get to your speakers and get to your ears. When you have a high signal noise ratio, all those super fine little details, the decays of notes, the decay of a transient, the sound of a room, those things can all get masked by that. Now, Rotel also built its reputation on designing their products in-house, but like a lot of other manufacturers, they outsourced the manufacturing of their units to other folks, but they did that because then they could obviously have the relationship with the manufacturer, pick the, co the components and everything else, design everything, and then have someone else just assemble it and that helps contain costs. 
we see that a lot with a lot of manufacturers, obviously, um, building in, in, in products in, in China. So anyway, the Rotel, the sound quality of this thing was, it was clean. And I, at the time, was running it. I ran it on a pair of TDL transmission line speakers, which I'd had in, in and around my system for a really long time. Um, I also ran it on uh, Boston Acoustics. Um, in this particular case, it was another speaker we're gonna talk about later, but on the on the big Boston Acoustics, their big statement piece, I did run it on a pair of KEF 1022s, which is a stand mount speaker, very much like a Celestian, really nice KEF reference 102s. And it had a good, clean sound. It wasn't super punchy. It was it had good dynamics, but not super low end, not at that point. Um, it was still very much kind of, uh, had the, the, the traditional kind of Japanese sound signature to it, which obviously is a lot more emphasis in the mid-range and higher frequencies just because of the nature of their their native music and, and the way they like to listen. But it started to change and, you know, you'd get more authority as the designs came out. But anyway, this was my first introduction to Rotel. And it was a really pleasing amplifier, really nice to use, um, good build quality, very good build quality, and great sound. It was really, it was really nice. I had... We took it, we took, we used to take a lot of this stuff in trade. We took this in trade and I think I had it at home for probably, I don't know, a couple of months and it left an impression, which is why it's on the list. Cause it was one of the first um, kind of Japanese brand. Marantz was a Japanese brand, but you didn't identify it as Japanese. Harman Kardon, a lot of their stuff was made in Japan, but you didn't identify it as a Japanese brand. So this is one of the first Japanese kind of traditional Japanese brands that I really that really grabbed my attention and got me uh, interested in that whole category of products. Anyway, the Rotel RX803, really neat stuff. Well, a lot of regular viewers will recognize this piece. This is my Marantz PM74D integrated amplifier from 1988. They sold new for about 900 bucks, give or take. Um, it's rated at 105 by 2 into 8 ohms. However, when tested by in period by magazines, they got 132 at 8, they got 196 at 4, and 307 watts at 2 ohms. This thing is a bit of a beast. Frequency response of 18 hertz to 70,000, really high damping factor. It can drive almost anything. I've had it driving very difficult loads like MagnaPan and Martin Logan and things like that. It's a burly beast of an amp. Now, this is not a regular production amp. This was an engineering piece that was sent over from Japan um, through the uh, through Philips at that time, who owned Marantz Japan, to Marantz USA, which was owned by a company called Dynascan and called Beretta Detector, for their engineering staff to approve for sale in the U.S. I wound up with it because we were Marantz dealer. Dynascan was located right, literally about six miles or seven miles from where I live, um, and they brought it in to do demos for us and they wound up leaving it there and I wound up buying it. Um, so, and I'll show you uh, the sticker on the bottom indicating that it's an engineering sample. Anyway, this thing is a beauty. It uses a really unique feature. Now, there was above this, the PM84 and the PM94, and I've owned all of those. Um, unfortunately, the PM94, someone offered me a stupid amount of money, so I sold it. The PM84, oh my God, to this day, I regret it. I dropped it. I broke it. I dropped it. It weighed about 45 pounds. I was trying to put it up on a shelf. I dropped it. I broke it. Broke my heart. But I kept this one. So that's good because this gets me part of the way there. All three of the amplifiers were known for what was called quarter A. So they ran at 25% of their rated power in pure class A mode, and then they would switch to class AB. Then you've seen me talk about that crossover distortion from, you know, what A creates the whole, the class A creates the whole waveform, class AB hands off the work to each transistor and the crossover notch distortion there. So this doesn't exhibit any of that for almost every listening level you can imagine. And I'll tell you right now, if you're listening in, you know, like most people do, upper 60s into the 70 range dB, you're not using more than a watt, maybe two at the most, seriously. So the, having the Class A was really, really nice. The other really interesting thing about this too is, for an integrated amplifier at the time, it had both a moving magnet and a moving coil phono uh, stage in it, which is really, really nice. You guys seen me open it up in the regular video, so I'm not going to go hugely into the depth of, you know, all the technical details. But one interesting function it had is called CD or Phono Direct, and it bypasses tone controls, bypasses balance. It doesn't bypass the switches, but it does bypass the entire tone circuitry for a little cleaner sound, and I can actually hear that difference, so that's really, really nice. So this is, here's the, the tail of the tape on this. This is 
the classic 70s, 80s, and I don't know when it stopped, but it did. Morant's sound, warm, engaging, huge uh, image, amazingly deep bass, amazing power, amazing dynamics, amazing detail and resolution, but with a very, very pleasant kind of characteristic to it. You can listen to this, and I have listened to this for hours, years, um, and it's just the most engaging, just friendly piece. It will rock hard when you want it to, and it'll whisper in your ear when you want it to. It's just a wonderful piece, and I will never part with it. And I have another integrated amp, which you're going to see next, that is very much different, but kind of in the same vein for me. So anyway, the Marantz PM74D, an absolute 80s standout for me. So the last one we're going to talk about is the Harman Kardon PM655 VXI. This is mine. Very nice. I love it. Um, it is a monster of an integrated amplifier. Now, these were available for sale from 1987 to 1988, and then they changed the nomenclature. But prior to that, there was a 655, but it didn't have the VXI nomenclature. And VXI, the V, it was just a way to indicate this had video switching, not sig, not picture switching, but audio for video switching, you know, VCR input, that kind of thing. Um, it's a real brute. Rated at 90 watts into 8 ohms. Actually measured 120 into 8, 200 into 4, and 260 into 2 ohms. High current capability, which is a big deal. We're going to talk about that just briefly because I'm going to do a full history of Harman Kardon. High current capability of plus or minus 45 amps. So very, very, very ballsy. Um, frequency response of 0.2 hertz to 150,000 hertz. So ultra wide bandwidth, high current. Those were the mantra. They were the marketing hooks for Harman Kardon during this entire period. Starting in the late 70s, Harman Kardon, never, they didn't play the Watt Wars. They weren't going after, you know, 300 watt of channel receivers. What they did do was they built receivers that had dual mono, two separate mono amplifiers, two separate power supplies inside. Maybe they were only rated at 40 or 60 watts, but they punched way above their weight class and sounded far more dynamic, cleaner, crisper, better than products with infinitely more power than they did. And that's when they started to earn the reputation as kind of the audiophile, entry-level audiophile brand. This was upper-level mid-fi, entry-level, you know, kind of entry-level high-end uh, product category. And as speakers got better and as digital came in, obviously the resolution of digital really made all of the shortcomings of, you know, a bad design show up. So Harman was was in on digital very early on. I think after Philips and Marantz, there might have been only one other company that brought out a CD player uh, immediately, and that was Harman Kardon. It was a, a CD100, and they followed it up with a CD500, and then they came out in a couple of years with a whole series, the 200, 400, and 800, all marvelous CD players, really good sounding, really well built, and that was an all, also another hallmark, hallmark of Harman Kardon. So not going into, into a, a great deal of depth, but in, in the mid-80s, or 83, 84, Harman brought out, a, they had their citation line, which they'd always had since the 60s, which is their high-end, you know, uh, cost no object, engineering no object kind of product. They'd reinvigorate it with the Citation 12 and then the Citation 16. And actually, the Citation 12 had two AC power cords because it truly was two mono amplifiers on one chassis. But they resurrected the Citation name big time in the late 70s. And in 1983 or 84, they came out with the Citation XX or the Citation 20. And this was a $6,000. This was Dr. Harmon's passion product, project. It was a cost no object, build the absolute best amplifier in the world period. And they did. 6000 bucks. It came in its own shipping crate. They literally delivered it in a truck with a hydraulic lift gate and a couple of big burly guys that helped get, help you get it in the house and unpack it. It was the result of a cooperative effort between Harman Kardon and a gentleman named Dr. Matty Atoli. He was a Finnish researcher. And he discovered, rightfully so, that total harmonic distortion, THD, is really more or less a meaningless specification. And part of the reason why is almost every speaker in the world has a greater than 1% total harmonic distortion. So it really doesn't matter how low your total harmonic distortion is on your electronics. As long as it's below 1%, you're good to go. But it became a marketing tool for people. How many watts per channel? How low is the THD? And because of that, a lot of the product in this period were chasing, you know, these vanishing THD numbers, and they were engineering the product to produce really low total harmonic distortion, but not, they weren't very good sounding. That was the other issue. So much negative feedback, 
just all, you know all kinds of components in the way to reduce THD because the measurement looked good on a marketing sheet. So Harman didn't play that game. This has 0.08, which is absolutely fine. But what Harman determined, or what Dr. Maliatola determined, was that intermodulation distortion or transient intermodulation, excuse me, transient intermodulation distortion, called acronym TIM or TIM, was far more audible than THD. So they worked on it, how to get, this only has 12 decibels of negative feedback in it. And that's remarkable because there was product peer, products from its peers that were in the 40, 50, 60 dBs of negative uh, feedback in it. And again, that crushes the sound. So Dr. Atola was able to figure out how to reduce transient intermodulation distortion with very intelligent circuit design, very high quality components. So on amplifiers, when you look at specifications for Harman Kardon amplifiers for this period, you'll see the specification of transient intermodulation distortion is not a percentage, not a dB number. It is unmeasurable. So they went after it hard and heavy. And one of the other things that did that was super ultra wide bandwidth, again, 0.2 hertz to 150,000 hertz and high current capability, again, plus or minus 45 amps. So at this period of time, this was when Harman was really dominating that upper mid-fi, entry-level, high-end marketplace like no one else had done. And really, the, the thing that they focused on, again, was the ultra-wide bandwidth and the high current capability. And because, obviously, for transients and for, for big peaks, you need current more than you need watts. And so it was really, the idea was, is you had enough current, you could deliver all that power without any distortion. And that really became a really important part. So it was, um, you know, they could sound crisp and clean, and you could drive these things. You could run 100 dB, you know, get a big pair of JBL speakers, which, of course, Harman owns JBL. You get a big pair of those, you could crank that thing up to concert levels, and this thing wouldn't get hot, would never miss a beat. They were just amazing. Mm -hmm. So the PM655 is an absolute benchmark product. It is an exa a perfect example of that period when Harman Kardon was just hitting on all eight cylinders, just going, great guns, great engineering, great research, great build quality, amazing build quality, tremendously dynamic power. This thing it has an amazing sound quality. Now, it does have a bit of it, a V-curve sound to it. Obviously, with owning JBL and Infinity, those speakers kind of had a V-curve and you wanted to accentuate that. So it can get a little hot on the top end. Uh, so you just pair it with the right speakers. But this thing can just, it's ballsy and dynamic and it can roar like a lion. And it can whisper just sweetly in your ear and just tell you all the wonderful things you want to hear. It's just a remarkable product, and I'm really, really proud to own it. So anyway, that's the wrap-up on my top five receiver slash integrated amplifiers for the 1980s. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little trip down memory lane, going and reminiscing with me about wonderful stuff from the 80s. Um, and if you did enjoy it, I would hope you'd give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to support the channel, there is a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. There will also be a membership link in the pinned comment and in the video description. There are Amazon affiliate links in the video description. And of course, you know the drill with those. Um, there are my playlists there. Please comment. Please let me know. What was your favorite piece from the 80s? Was it something you owned? Maybe was it something a parent owned or a sibling owned or a friend owned? Was there a piece you really lusted after um, that you were never able to get or that that maybe eventually you're going to get. Um, let me know. Please share. I really enjoy that part of it. Anyway, I think I've done it all. Please like, subscribe, comment, follow me on Instagram. My name's Ed Holmwood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel saying now it's your turn to reminisce fondly about the 80s and mall hair and funny shoulder pads and great gear that we had. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. with you feel the rhythms break through music's heartbeat song